The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. Perpetual is a dynamic, active manager offering an extensive range of specialist investment capabilities, including Australian and global equities, credit, fixed income, multi-asset, as well as environmental, social and governance, designed to help meet the needs of clients across Australia and New Zealand. Underpinned by our long-standing and market-leading Australian equities capability, Perpetual also offers an extensive contemporary range of funds. As one of Australia's longest-serving and most trusted investment managers, our long-standing commitment is to deliver superior outcomes over the long term to clients. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and uh, today I'm pumped to be here with Steve Nielsen. Steve and I uh, went on tour with the with the AFA on their roadshow what seems like a lifetime ago uh, off the back of him taking out their Excellence in Education Award and um, obviously I picked up a few tips on here, <laughs> off him on the way because I managed to take it out myself a, a few years later. Um, but uh, Steve runs a business Asset Wealth Management, um, based out of Bris Vegas, uh, is a super guru when it comes to technical stuff. But um, today, I'm more keen to unpack a bit about the the journey around his business and the things that he's focused on today. Steve, thanks for joining us, mate. No worries, Ben. Good to be here. It's uh, it's been a little while. It has been. It has been. It's uh, the old COVID spanner it means uh, less less Sydney trips for you, less Brisbane trips for me. So it's uh, it's good to be chatting. And um, your your business has been going for, you know, a bit over 14 years. So uh, clearly some serious uh, long, longevity there. So I'm keen to talk a bit about that, that journey and um, maybe that's a, a good place to start if you could just unpack how you've ended up where you are today. No worries at all, Ben. Um, I guess really uh, I'd always been, well, Back from the, the 90s was when I first got into advice in a salaried role uh, back in the old days of uh, Suncorp Financial Planning and uh, sort of learnt my, learnt my skills as a salaried advisor and then moved into sort of the channel management side, looking after a team of advisors uh, in Brisbane. And, you know, within an organisation like Suncorp, there were other opportunities to sort of develop uh, skills. So I did some project management became a, a Six Sigma black belt, which uh, was sort of to work on uh, process and uh, improve things like lead conversions and just generally work on business problems within that network and sort of got back into working with self-employed advisors as a result of that and then practice management uh, both with Suncorp and then over to MLC uh, where I was there uh, doing that that sort of role till about 2007. Then the opportunity came up to buy a practice right before the GFC, which was uh, awesome timing on my part. Uh, so uh, we <laughs> jumped in, jumped in with both boots and um, bought, a, bought a practice on the south side of Brisbane. I was, a, I was uh, attracted to this practice because uh, it actually had been around at that stage for about 25 years. Um, so now we're close to 40 years of, of being around with sort of up to three generations of family groups, uh, which, you know, we're still advising, you know, some of the mums and dads, their kids, and now their kids, um, which has 
sort of led to the way we've built our business and developed our skills around being really holistic and looking at all different manner of advice needs uh, in that client base. So it's been a it's been a journey, and obviously, it's not only what's been going on within the business and with our in our clients. We've also been impacted by the uh, environment we live in, as we all have over, particularly over the last four or five years, particularly. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it is being it has been quite a journey. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the rate of change seems to be accelerating, although potentially we've, we've uh, gotten through the, the chunky part of it, although we keep saying that and then it keeps on the coming. So well, I suppose time yeah. will help. But uh, I did not know that about the the Six Sigma um, uh, thing, but it probably makes sense as to how you run such an efficient operation. So I've um, done a little bit of study of some of those lean methodologies as part of the some work with our business coach and uh yeah not not fully uh, by the book in terms of six sigma stuff but super effective in, in terms of that approach and just like what's the most important thing how do you get there and uh i think as you mentioned with all of the change that's going on we need to be flexible as we're rolling stuff out to make sure that it fits with you know how the world is um at, at, yeah. at that time what do your clients, you mentioned three generations, so obviously there's a bit of a spread there, but what, is a, what do your typical clients look like and um, what do you do for them and what does your team look like? So I guess the sweet spot, and it, it's probably something that is, is no secret to most advisors, is you know, the sweet spot are clients that are you know, five years older and five years younger in a lot of ways. So for me, being in my early 50s, it's pre and post retirement. Um, more pre uh, at this stage, but it's really building wealth for people that are starting to free themselves of the shackles of debt. Uh, and, and, you know, kids are probably not costing as much in, in their upkeep and, and are starting to leave home. And just that final run into retirement to make sure that positions are optimised and, and we're basically on a good path towards achieving all of those those goals and rejectors, you know, financial and non-financial for uh, for people as they become, you know, come into retirement. I guess there's some empathy on my part, obviously not that I'm retiring anytime soon, but I, I certainly have the impacts that uh, a number of my clients are facing uh, as we sort of enter this stage of life, uh, particularly in that most of us, you know, still have some responsibility uh, for, you know, teenage, late teenage children. And at the same time, we're starting to do more for our parents who are getting into that that elderly uh, frailty mm. sort of generation. And, you know, so I guess some of the advice needs that come through, are, you know, sitting sort of contingent to that particular group that we do most of our work with, uh, you know, the, um, the starting off the, the kids uh, as they're starting to uh, make their way in the world. And then at the same time, um, I, I myself have uh, built some expertise in aged care, uh, having advised a number of our clients' parents in, you know, on their transition to you know, the retirement village world or even at the later stages into a, an aged care facility. Um, so you know, Gavin, Gavin in the business will sort of be uh, more involved in the um, starting that starting the journey and, and building uh, building a, a, a future as far as wealth management uh, goes for the kids as they're starting in their working life, and I'm probably more at the other end uh, at the aged care piece. Uh, you know, becoming more and more a focus um, of the other stuff we do. Well, I can speak from personal experience there that I know that you're the guru of that stuff. And for me, that's just uh, so complicated that it's it's been yeah. in a too hard basket for for some time. And it's not the sort of thing that you want to, you know, get wrong or, or get mixed up with. You only really get one crack at it. So, yeah, re- really critical. How did you, just on that one, how did you go about building that knowledge? Uh, it was a fair bit of uh, study and research. Um you know, I, I worked alongside the Aged Care Steps uh, group, uh, Louise Beatty um, and, and her business uh, to get some some knowledge. And my licensee also 
uh, had a, a fair bit of support in in that area as well. It's it's quite sad, really, though, because I'm I went and had a look at a local aged care facility that's just opening in our local neighbourhood on the weekend. Um, I, I like to go and have a look where our clients might end up might end up looking for places, and um, we we were touring around this facility, and they took us to this. Um, this double room and they've got a few of these double rooms in the in the building and they um you know so mum and dad can move in there together and everybody's saying oh it's a lovely room it's a big it's a big studio room with a sitting area and all of that sort of thing and quite a quite a different thing to what aged care facilities have been in the past and all i could think about was oh mum and dad going in together that'd be two um refundable accommodation deposits <laughs> <laughs> i only just think of the money you know so um i've been uh, i've been sort of talking about this far too much if, <laughs> if that's what i'm thinking of with this beautiful facility and i'm thinking about the money yeah well look it's uh it's not everything but it's not nothing either so um absolutely yeah, yeah. Um, Steve, your business, as I said, you've been you've been at it in your business for fourteen years, and you mentioned there's been twenty five uh, years of history prior to that. Yeah. What have been the the big sort of shifts uh, over that over the time that you've been involved in in the business, and how did you tackle bringing the business sort of into the future? I, I guess when I when I jumped out of uh, employment. Uh, and and bought the business the concepts of of professionalism and increasing education standards and and um, you know how we actually charged for our services were sort of starting to be whispered about you know like are commissions appropriate you know our entry fee products you know where we see ourselves going in the future and I guess over time, and you know, I'm talking 2008, coming through the uh, the GFC, uh, that whisper sort of started to grow in um, in loudness, and 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 then we had, you know, FOFA come along, and uh, it was pretty clear that what we had thought about as just being best practice was actually going to be the rules of the game going forward. So, I, I guess in the way my business has evolved. Um, we moved into a practice that had um, as its charging methodology um, a taking the trailing commission on investments and superannuation, which was payable at that time, and then a cocktail arrangement where we where the uh, previous owner would uh, ink pay a like an advice fee to bring the um, the fee up to a, an acceptable level for the work done. So my my move into the practice pretty much immediately was to uh, to start by rebating trailing commission and just charging a fee based on the um, the time taken to prepare and deliver the advice as well as its value to um, better reflect the work that we did and it sort of stood us in good stead as the years went by particularly in that the licensee I was with went through an advice remediation process um, which coincidentally started in 2009 by the time that pretty much all of our clients were across on the full fee basis as opposed to commissions. Mm. So when you um, when you calculate refunding, the licensee took the decision to uh, refund fees that had been charged, a percentage of the fees that had been charged, rather than going through the process of looking at every single file, they made a decision to refund a percentage of everybody's fees. So we maximised the outcome for our clients because we rebated trailing commission and converted them all to fees. And um, consequently, their outcome when that refund went through was significantly better than what it otherwise would have been. So, right. um, nice. so it was a nice byproduct, but it was also the right thing to do by the clients at the time, set us up well for FOFA. And I guess as time has gone by, the natural extension of FOFA, I guess, has been the, uh, the code of ethics. Uh, developing around some of the key concepts that come out of FOFA, um, and I think it's uh, it's you know unfortunately it's the, the challenge that we have as financial planners today is not necessarily that a code of ethics is a bad thing. It's just that there isn't tangible measures on which to manage 
or assess performance. Uh, we, we basically are, you know, doing right by clients, but if someone else's perception is not quite the same as yours, there mm. needs to be some some dis- discrepancy there, and that's, I guess, the confusion that um, that I guess everybody's facing. But um, all in all, uh, the practice has remained um, probably as a result of licensees always striving to be at that higher level, just to make sure that they were right right above any line that was what was drawn re- on the regulation side of things. Um, we ourselves as advisors in that network have, have been sort of following that, which has stood us in pretty good stead, I think. And so. you, mentioned, you mentioned when we were chatting just before about the, the quality of advice review and what you've just mentioned there about, you know, ethics and the, the, the ambiguity around the interpretation of those rules. I know yeah. that you, you um, love all of that sort of, you know, super detail um, stuff and, and uh, get, you know, get pretty involved in the advice, you know, industry more broadly. What's your take on, on where things are headed from here? I think we got a good opportunity. Uh, there have been, and I've, you know, probably a bit boring and that I've read a few submissions and I've made, you know, made contributions to a few, a few submissions as well for, um, you know, in professional associations that I'm, I'm a part of. Uh, but I think we have a good opportunity to sort of inform the, uh, the regulators or the, um, the regulators through this review that, you know, of the roadblocks, I, th- I guess, to providing uh, good quality advice that's in the best interests of clients. Um, one of the things that I saw recently was, you know, the, uh, the, the review itself has been uh, a little bit, shocked I guess about the fear that's out there that advisors have for the regulators so um, I, I see that the um, I see that the submissions are are doing a, a fair job of conveying why that fear is uh, is in place you know it's that ambiguity as I, as I said uh, that there would be a role uh, for a reduction in the complexity that would certainly help client outcomes um, we're talking you know, about making sure that advisors have more confidence and, and are more comfortable providing more focused support and advice to clients. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we're adding 20 pages to a statement of advice. We might take 20 pages off a statement of advice and be able to convey, convey a clearer message uh, and clearer intent, which I think is is ultimately where we're heading. Um, so, the quality of advice review, I think, presents us with a great opportunity. I, I just hope uh, that the um, the airplay that it deserves is is continued, and we actually see some tangible change as a result of of those submissions. Well, I think it sounds like from from what I've read that at least ASIC seem to be fairly clear on where like broadly what the issues are when you talk about like the complexity of advice and um, yeah. the, the, the length that, uh, of advice and density relative to our clients, you know, want or desire <laughs> or understanding yeah. of, um, of that stuff. So yeah, fingers crossed. I'd love, to, I'd love to see a, sh- a shorter SOA with um, streamlining the important thing. So as you say, that we can be doing the right thing by clients, but um, have it clear and efficient and easy, and sort of bring down some of those costs to serve to make things accessible to to more people. I think some of the tech can help us as well as you you'd be you'd be right across Ben. You know, like there's some there's some solutions there where um, advice can be delivered in in presentation format, if you like, and if it's it's if it's delivered sort of electronically, potentially there are measures within that software that can confirm, help a client, you know, indicate their confirmation of, of the material uh, that, they've, uh, that they've been presented with and hence have a, a better informed client and a more engaged interaction with the advisor. So, and it's not going to be for, you know, everybody. And I mean, from my perspective, there'll be a hardcore group of our clients that will still be traditional paper-based advice uh, going forward, but there are certainly 
technological innovations which which make it a lot a lot better and a lot more cogent for for clients to uh, to be a part of that journey so here's hoping <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll keep both of our fingers crossed on on that yeah. one steve what you you mentioned there some of the things that have shifted in your business what are the things that haven't changed for you uh i think you know when we're talking about a number of generations and and client relationships uh i think that's got to be a, a sort of a, a, a bedrock in the business and and certainly the way that we engage with the clients that have been clients for a long time probably hasn't changed that much i.e you know face to face and being being part of that community group ourselves you know like it was just you know got went to a you know a recent you know been to funerals and you know the celebration of life for for clients that have passed away baptisms uh, a lot of the the personal interaction i think that's uh that's certainly whether that be you know on that face to face basis or whether you know we have more of a you know a, an electronic sort of interaction you know we've got clients that we you know haven't met face to face even that it's pretty much teams zoom DocuSign, all of the the technological means so it's i think the thing that hasn't changed mainly in the business is that we continue to meet clients where they live in a lot of ways whether that be electronically or or face to face in those groups uh, and the other thing is obviously the world is a changing place and we try to just be open to all of the things that are happening out there in the world and keep ourselves educated keep ourselves across developments in technology in in strategy and uh you know i think these days that becomes a, a a difficult thing to do but it's a worthy investment that needs to be continued for all of us i guess so you know that's that's where we are with that i suppose yeah look i think as uh as advice evolves and and some of the more basic elements of what we do are able to be partly done at least through technology then i feel like we are really that the main reason that people seek out and value they get from advice is that you know be, being at the center of everything and knowing how to cut through some of that noise to figure out what the things are that people do actually need to know um yeah so as you say not an easy job but uh but a crucial one i think and and probably more crucial as that continues into the future and i really value my involvement in the xy community because there's so many good ideas out there that uh that really inform my practice and you know i'm i'm hoping that you know there is some of the stuff that that i can bring to the table is is helpful as well but part of a being part of a community is is just everything i think for us at the moment well i think too that you know cutting through the noise piece that then there's a lot of minds that are seeing different things so um getting some of those ideas out there to yeah help us figure out what what we should be um yeah you know thinking is is really crucial steve what are you working on at the moment in your business so we've been grappling with uh increasing uh workloads uh we've been sort of not a massive growth business but we've certainly built some relationships with accounting practices uh, particularly around an area of expertise in self-managed super funds where accountants uh, not having the exemption uh, who knows what's going to happen after, out of their quality of advice review there's been some arguments for accountants to to sort of have get some of that sort of uh, ability to talk to self managed super funds back not sure how that's going to land but given given that relationship we've been picking up a, a few new funds to sort of provide some more of the technical advice uh, to both investments and uh, and strategy so the practice has gotten busier at the moment we've got one sort of admin manager and you know she works remotely and comes to Brisbane once a week we we compare notes we plan the week ahead and uh and work together uh, remotely but also uh, also face to face um I've, the other advisor in my practice uh you know both he and I sort of work from an office in Brisbane um but we sort of are out seeing clients as well so back and forth uh the the thing is looking for that next level of support you know potentially considering whether uh, that person sits in our office with us in brisbane so we have a person on the ground in brisbane 
the whole time, or whether in fact we can manage the um, manage the geography by uh, maybe having um, an overseas outsourcing solution. And you know that's that's the big thing that um, I'm working on at the moment is to just make that choice. And uh, I'm I'm sort of attracted to the ability for overseas outsourcing to be scalable, so that you necessarily don't need to go all boots and all on day one you can actually just build into your process and your practice the uh, the skills and and um, you know resources that you need at a particular time and um, you know the knowledge of financial planning and the experience with other financial planners I guess gives me a lot more confidence in the um, the knowledge and experience of these providers to to sort of add some meaningful support to our world um, so we're uh, you know, actively, actively pursuing that at the moment. Sort of ticked our licensee box, and now we're um, you're looking at what might be a solution for us there. Mm. Yeah, for us, we've been on this journey. As I was chatting to you just before we fired up the um, the recording, but for some time, and I tried a couple of times with offshore uh, team members once through a BPO, once through a work from home type arrangement, and both times they didn't work. Probably. Yeah a large part because of how we sort of, you know, onboarded them and the work, um, but also partly because of the the individuals that we chose and the roles that we were looking at at that time. But for us, yeah. we had, had a great experience for the last three years with with offshoring, like like I think any team member that there or, you know, any team that there are challenges with that and um, things that you need to do and learnings that you, you need to have um, mm. uh, around that. But... We've got a we've got nine or so in the Philippines at the minute, and uh, those guys are great technical. You know, we've we've got our power planning team there, our implementation team, and then some um, admin uh, and marketing support there as well. And uh, for those guys, I find they're, they're just a pure extension of our Sydney team. Um, yeah. Cost effective, you know, relative to the cost of getting someone on, on ground, but also that. We've just like with our power planners, we just really struggled to get good power planners um, yeah. here. And then we've hired associates, and they want to learn how to be advisors, and they don't want to necessarily be tied up yeah. with a bunch of admin and and plans as well. Um, so it was partly just a you know job person fit um, as much as anything as well. But our recent learning has been that they're sort of only. A, a, Choosing good people is obviously important, and that's why for us we've got a BPO that has a very strong recruitment arm, um, yep. which I think is really important to find great people to begin with. But then, if the more you put in in terms of their onboarding, training, and development, then the more the more you can take away. So, uh, I think it's definitely the future, particularly in light of the the I don't want to say skill shortage, but like the just the challenges around hiring and advice at the moment that yeah. Um, big population, um, people that are super keen to learn and, and switched on. So uh, they're really good insights, you know, and, and it's 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 a lot like, you know, it's the, the issues, you know, a lot of them are consistent with, you know, the face to face hire and development of staff. You know, we've, we've yeah. had our own horror we've had our own horror stories as I've told you, you know, and um, you know, I I sort of uh, think the time is right to to sort of try something new, and the scalability of it really, you know, impresses me. And um, as I said, you know, the the pathfinders have been out there like yourself and uh, have built built those skills in a lot of ways. And there's other providers as well. But um, yeah, no, I think the time's right to to go down that path for us as the next step. Exciting, exciting times ahead. I think it's all that stuff. Like it's a, it's a whole uh, skill set and and function that you need to build into your business with recruiting, hiring, onboarding, training, development, management. Like it's, um, I think sometimes you just get lucky, and we have been in the past. You just find great people, even yeah. when you don't know what you're doing, and it just works because it works. But not, it doesn't work because you made like you made it work. Um, so I think it's the yeah it's it's just a skill but a valuable one if you can crack the crack the code um, or at least Absolutely. crack it enough to make it work. Yeah, Steve, yeah. my um my last question for you, if you could 
if you could go back to your, uh, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed self 14 years ago when you were, you know, buying into that business and, and, um, and rolling down the shingle or, or repolishing the shingle in your case um, and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? That's a, yeah, that's a interesting question. Uh, <laughs> I, I think really probably, and it may have been a, may have been a, a, um, a product of just what time it was at the, you know, we basically had just started the roll down in the GFC. We were sort of halfway through the um, the reduction in asset values, and panic was sort of running pretty high. And I guess really the only, you know, the advice that I'd probably go back and give myself was just believe in yourself and understand that you're coming to this from a background of of experience of down markets over, you know, a, a number of previous occasions and you know this too shall pass uh, we obviously got through but certainly I probably worried about a lot more than what I really needed to in that you know I was paranoid about making the business work and making it profitable and, and obviously going into it with some level of you know of financial stress as you as you you know never borrowed that much money before um, yeah. But if I could go back and tell myself just to calm down and take a chill pill, uh, just rely, <laughs> rely on your, rely on your, um, your skills and experience more, and believe in yourself. I think that's probably the biggest thing. And and I'd say that to anybody who was mulling a, a decision like that, it's just you've done the you've done the work. You wouldn't be considering this sort of thing if you weren't prepared to do it. So just believe in yourself and do it. And take a chill pill. I like that. And take a chill pill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> bring bring it bring it back the the eighties and nineties into conversation. That's uh, that's a chill pill. <laughs> I'm more the X of the X Y. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, mate. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Really appreciate it. Exciting times ahead. Great, Ben. Thanks for the opportunity. It's always good to talk to you.